be in the book of Jeremiah again today, part two of what we started last week, the book of Jeremiah, and uh, though we'll begin in 2 Chronicles again, um, the book of Jeremiah will be in chapter 31 for the predominant portion of our time, if you want to make your way there, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, and uh, around verse 31 to 38 for the majority of our time. Let's begin with a word of prayer. We thank you that though you require us to have new hearts that you supply. Fulfilled your promise of the new covenant by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. That his blood was shed and his body broken for us. And through such great sacrifice, bearing not only the physical punishment, but your entire judgment upon sin in himself. Lord, we thank you that you have done so much for we who are dead in our sins. Lord, I pray for each of us to revel in the new covenant And for any who hear your word today who have not yet done so, to finally accept what Jesus has done on their behalf. Lord, work in hearts. Magnify yourself to us. Transform lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah, as we started last week, a predominant theme Within the book, when we look at the historical t- context from Second Chronicles, the life of Jeremiah as he lived, the kings that he was even sent to as a prophet, we find that God, in his mercy and grace, requires a replacement of our hearts and not just a reform. Not just national reform, not just personal reform. This is the question we even began with last time. And even as we think about our own election and change possibly of leadership, even desiring change, a change for the better, praying to those ends, we have to come face to face with the question that national reform and a change in leadership truly change the course of a nation and prevent the judgment of God? And the answer from the book of Jeremiah is no. God requires us to have new hearts. Hearts that have been replaced. Hearts that are transformed. And now love God that are under covenant. And here, this new covenant, as we'll get to in chapter 31, is the hope offered to us in the book of Jeremiah in all the doom and gloom. If you haven't done so, read through the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations. It's not happy. Jeremiah himself is called to a difficult ministry and ends up in a pit, ends up being carried to Egypt against God's express direction. His nation is destroyed in his own lifetime, where many of the other prophets of God would foretell the coming judgment of God and the next generation would see it. Jeremiah lived it. But the hope is not in nations. The hope is not in reform. The hope is in God giving us new hearts by the new covenant. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, to kind of orient ourselves again and hopefully uh, bring back to mind what we covered last week, One final point 
on why God requires heart replacement and not reform. From the historical events going on during Jeremiah's life, notice that it says that the people of the land, that is of Israel, Judah here specifically, took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's place in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. And I would remind you, in our, our study last week, that his father, Josiah, was a great king, a good king, a moral, a righteous king. Under his reign, no other king had celebrated the Passover like Josiah had done and led the people to do. And now his son is made king in his father's place. But the king of Egypt opposed him in Jerusalem and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim, his brother, king over Judah in Jerusalem and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But Necho took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. And Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign. Also his father is Josiah, also the good king. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. But notice what happened during his reign. His father is the good king. He, Jehoiakim, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar also carried part of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his palace in Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and the abominations that he did, not just evil, but even abominations. What was found against him? Behold, are they written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah? And Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his place. And Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months and ten days. Talk about a short reign. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. In the spring of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the precious vessels of the house of the Lord and made his brother Zedekiah king over Judah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Have you figured out a pattern yet? Things have collapsed. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord against King Nebuchadnezzar and made him swear by God. Nebuchadnezzar came and, and made him swear by the, by the one true God that he well, and he did so and even with this promise, even with this pact and this sworn uh, promise. And he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart, not just against Nebuchadnezzar, but more importantly against who? Against turning his heart against the Lord, the God of Israel. And all the officers of the priests were exceedingly faithful, following the abominations of the nations, and they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. So the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But what happened? Did they respond? Did they, they cry out and weep over their sin as lamentations would teach us to do? Did they repent? No. They kept mocking the messengers of God his word and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. Even if we get the greatest present ever in the next election, it will not change the course of our nation. 
If you've not read the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, and others, and found no mention of the United States, you might want to. Do I think we have a good country fundamentally in our Constitution? Yes. But we are no different than the hearts of these people as a nation. And God has sent his word and God has sent messengers to proclaim, to to stop worshiping man, to stop worshiping idols, to stop killing the innocent. And we, like Judah of Jeremiah's day, need heart replacement. For the same very reason, because our hearts are stubborn and sinful. Our hearts are stuck sinful both individually and collectively. Did you notice how, how the different kings were more stuck and hardened their hearts and it affected the people so that even the people are mocking the messengers of God? And this is why we have to have heart replacement. They kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words, scoffing at his prophets. And notice how far it goes. Until there's no remedy. This is the path our own nation is embarked upon. And no election this fall will change it. Only the working of God in our country and changing of hearts will do that. Twice within our nation's history, we've had what we call awakenings. Where God has moved and people in numbers have been saved and finally repented. And the course of our nation has changed. One day after our own revolution. Then, again, later. And interestingly enough, it seems in the historical record, both of those were brought about by the pleas of God's people through earnest prayer. Praying for a change. Praying for people's hearts to be changed. Because God, who is merciful, who is gracious, requires heart replacement, not reform. Because to reform the sinful and stubborn hearts that we possess is to have a reformed, sinful, stubborn heart. It's still sinful, stubborn. So we need a replacement in Jeremiah chapter 31, if you'll go forward to there, we find the hope. We find God making a promise. God solving our problem. God fixing our hearts. Jeremiah chapter 31, picking up in verse 31 God says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and house of Judah. If you read the expanse of the Old Testament, you find out that this new covenant extends beyond Israel and Judah, and through the line of Abraham, everyone of every nation is to be blessed if they will accept it. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took my hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. If you read the account of Exodus, you find out that they're breaking God's covenant before it's even been sealed, even though they stood at the foot of the mountain. 
and declared all that God says we will do. And within 40 days of Moses being on the mountain and receiving the law, receiving the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God, they're building a golden calf, replacing God with an idol. So God says, I know the old covenant is purposeful, though useful. The New Testament tells us that the reason for the Old Testament is to be our schoolmaster, to teach us our failings, to show us through the examples of those who came before us, even as we looked at at the beginning of this series. But here is a new covenant. He's going to make a new covenant. This covenant, the new one that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer his brother saying, Know the Lord. For they shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If, one, if this fixed order departs from the Lord, then shall the spring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured, the nations of the earth can be explored, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt from the Lord, for the Lord from the tower of Hanael to the corner gate. There God promising their return after judgment. But did you notice he ties the existence of Israel to his keeping the created order. He declares himself the one who created all these things. He says, if any of them cease to be, that's the time when I will get rid of Israel. How does that fit in with the new covenant? Because he's promised to give them the new covenant, to write his laws on their hearts, not them alone, but us as well. And if the created order should fail, then we should worry. But God has not stopped holding the created order together. And so his word is sure. Notice here from these verses, first of all, concerning this new covenant, that this is the means that God gives us new hearts. We read in our scripture reading uh, Paul's instructions, really the Lord's instructions through Paul for the Lord's table, for the supper, Lord's Supper. Did you notice it was the new covenant? This is the new covenant with my blood, paid and bought for, sealed. The covenant, the, the, the treaty has been ratified. God does it, giving us new hearts. Behold, he says, the days are coming back in verse 31. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It is, I'm going to give them a new covenant. It's going to write on their hearts. In fact, he, he sent another messenger. One we will get to shortly, a man named Ezekiel, with a similar message. Now is he going to provide this new covenant all written on their hearts, but in Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 19 and 20, it says, and I will give them one heart 
and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. The same promise he gives to Jeremiah of giving the new covenant and writing their laws, uh, his law on our hearts, he repeats with Ezekiel. He says it the same. I will be their God. They're going to be my people. There's going to be a personal relationship, as we'll get to in a moment. We got rid of that stony heart, that stubborn heart, that heart that was rebellious and sinful, that heart that, that was so stubborn and mocked my messengers. I'm going to do open heart surgery, pull that out, and give them a new heart, a heart, a new spirit that he puts within us that replaces hearts of stone, that now is pliable, that now is receptive to God, to his word, and to a relationship with him. So God gives us a new heart through the covenant because he's merciful, because he's gracious. God doesn't have to do this. Except for he's promised to. Our worth is only found in being in his image that we're created in his image. And because of our sin, we do not deserve this. Israel, Judah, who have for so long run around in idolatry, do not deserve this. And yet, even as the judgment is happening, God promises the new covenant, promises them new hearts to fix the failings of their sinful ones. Verse 33, the first part, it tells us that part of what God is doing through the new covenant, giving us new hearts, is that we would internalize his word. Judah and Israel have been very good at external religion. Many of them still were, were wearing uh, actual copies of the Word of God upon uh, their foreheads and arms. I went to chaplain school in a lovely Fort Jackson. I don't recommend it for a vacation. What state is that? South Carolina. And I was there, and there were two Orthodox Jewish gentlemen who were also training to be chaplains. And we were on a bus trip on Saturday going to a remote location for some more training. We were going to a historical location to see ministry in action in, in various forms. And we had to stop the bus at a certain point so they could get off and do worship. And they went out, and as we're sitting there on the bus, they wrapped themselves with these leather bindings that held in the ends in these little boxes copies of the Word of God. And we do similar things. We're very good at the external, just putting the Word of God on. But here, God in His Word promises in the New Covenant new hearts that will internalize the Word of God. Notice how He says it in verse 33. This covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, my people. Instead of just external conformity, it will be a change from the inside out. So that now we respond in joy in response to the love shown us, even as Paul says in Colossians 3, verse 12, that we who are in Christ have been chosen by him, beloved. And because of that, we then to put on the nature of Christ. 
It's not a list of do's and don'ts. Rather, it's a natural response for us having been loved by God. And here, the Word of God tells us that the promise of the new covenant is instead of trying to conform outwardly, God is going to fix it and give us His Word from within. So that even as Jesus says to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, if you knew who I was, you would ask of me and I would give you life springing up from within you like a well of water. Instead of trying to absorb it from the outside, it would come from within. Because the law, just even like our own national laws, only prevent us. It prevents us by threat of penalty. Where with God's word on our hearts and flowing out of us, has us respond in love and rejoicing to him and desire to obey and not out of, of judgment. For as Paul is no longer in us. And so God, merciful and gracious, gives us new hearts that internalize his word. No, I do is do our new hearts internalize his word, but the result of new hearts is a personal relationship with him. Did you catch it in Ezekiel? Did you catch it here in Jeremiah? No longer will it be my wayward people, but rather they will be my people. I will be their God. On that day when he makes this new covenant, he puts his laws on our hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother say, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. New heart. What's required and what result us in having a personal relationship with God? No longer to come with to go through priests. There is one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. And through him we can come boldly to the throne of grace. My wife pointed this illustration out to me the other evening, and I just have to use it. We were watching a TV series on three as a nation, and here comes two paws, and then four, and then slides down my legs. 60 And my wife turns to me and looks at me and says, this is a demonstration of what we have in Jesus. And I was like, what in the world is she talking about? Because the dog thinks it's his right to get on my lap. And it is our right to come into the presence of God. So we only have to get permission. We don't have to give the sad dog, puppy dog eyes. It is our right through Jesus Christ when we have the new covenant, when we have a new heart, we have a personal relationship with God. We don't have to ask. We're welcome in. It's why Jesus tells us in the New Testament, come unto me, all of you. You're laboring. You're heavy laden. Come. Come. I'll give you rest. God, merciful and gracious, gives us new hearts that result in a personal relationship with Him. None of us had to come and bring a lamb this morning or this afternoon to sacrifice to get right with God. 
None of us had to stand there and take the knife and cut the lamb's throat. And watch it burn. The price has been paid. The covenant has been enacted. And now we have uh, the ability to have a relationship with God that very few up until Jesus Christ ever got to experience. Some, like Enoch, walked with God. Abraham trusted God so that he had, was counted as righteousness, his faith. Moses, many others. And now it's available to all. Because God provides it through the new covenant by giving us a new heart. And God merciful and gracious, gives us new hearts that are forgiven by him. This should astound us. This, even as Roger was mentioning earlier, should make us go, wow. Because he's the one we've wronged. He's the one that bore the penalty. And he's the one that provides the forgiveness. Chapter 31, verse 34, the last part. Notice what God says. Not only are they going to know me, I will forgive their iniquity. And I will remember their sin no more. If you want forgiveness, if you want to know that there is, as Paul writes, no longer any condemnation, or we could even say it this way, I am no longer damned to hell. Be forgiven by God. Through Jesus Christ alone. God says, I'm going to do it. They don't deserve it, but I'm going to do it anyways. Under this new covenant, when I give them new hearts, they're going to be forgiven, and I will remember their sin no more. Not only are they forgiven, but I'm not going to bring it up. One of the tropes of our culture, especially in marriages, we watched any sort of comedy or situational comedy it is the wife who knows best and the dumb husband who does things and has to ask for forgiveness, but then his wife forgives him, but then brings it up later. Maybe you've even lived that. Thankfully, I have not. And how cutting that can be. Well, remember when you were an idiot? Yes, I'm still breathing. I'm still an idiot. Could you imagine hearing that from God? Hey, do you remember when? And yet, like the psalmist, we know. My sin is ever before me. And God here promises forgiveness that purposely does not remember our sin. Who, who in effect cannot forget, says, I'm not going to remember it anymore. I'm purposely not going to remember. This is one of the great encouragements under the new covenant that when we are forgiven, is remembered against us no more. It's paid for, done, in full. That's why Paul can be so adamant, why Peter and John can tell us so straightforwardly that in Jesus Christ, sin is forgiven, period. God promises even his wayward people 
Israel, Judah, who were so steeped in idolatry that, that even the nations around them, if you read the history, blushed. It was even a bit much for them. The murder of children to, to appease the gods, burning them alive. How do you explain that to your wife? Oh, honey, you know how you just have little Johnny? Well, you know, I needed a sacrifice for the God to make him happy with me. So I took him down and burned him. He's dead. How do you console a wife for that? How do you stay breathing after that? And she doesn't murder you. I don't know. And that's what they were doing. Even by the point of the end of our, our section there in Second Chronicles, even in the house of God, even in the temple in Jerusalem, the temple God had dedicated that were, was built under the direction of Solomon. And even to that, God says with the new covenant, when I give them new hearts, I will forgive their sin and remember it no more. Because God is merciful. God is gracious. When he gives us new hearts, they are forgiven by him. So are we trying to reform our wicked hearts and failing miserably at it? How's your New Year's resolutions going? Maybe you didn't even make them because you knew you would just fail. Oh, I'm going to be a better person this year. I'm going to stop this. I'm going to do that. How's that going for you? When will you stop trying to reform your wicked heart? It's just not going to work. Instead, will you accept the new covenant by the blood of Jesus and have a new heart given you by God? The instructions to Paul there, the, the very instructions that what Jesus says in the Gospels, this is my body, broken for you. This is my blood, the new covenant. Will you accept it? It's a gift as is written throughout the New Testament. Whoever receives him to them, God gave the power to become sons. To we who are dead in this sin with these wicked hearts, God has offered the gift of salvation. Will you accept it? Or are you going to keep trying to spin your wheels, reforming your wicked heart? We accept the new covenant by the blood of Jesus Christ and receive a new heart from God. Really, it boils down to this. Will you be forgiven today and enjoy a personal relationship with God? The message to the people in Jeremiah's day is the one we need. Not reform. Would I love lower taxes? Would I love to have groceries affordable? Power bills and gas bills to go back down? Oh, yeah. Would I welcome that? Oh, yes. But more than that, we need as a nation, we need each individual one of us to be forgiven and have a relationship with God. Without this, no form of reform in our nation will ever be enough, personally or nationally. And even the people of Jeremiah's day who were faithful to God learned it the hard way. Because after Nebuchadnezzar came through, they got the bright idea, let's 
Egypt, even though God said not to. It didn't go so well for them. Will you be forgiven? Will you enjoy a personal relationship with God? It's not a drudgery. It's not a to-do list. It's not a do's and don'ts. It is, as said of Moses, everyone else, I spoke through visions, but God said about Moses, I speak to him face to face. And through Jesus, we have that same opportunity to enter even to the throne room of God. We be forgiven. Without forgiveness, we cannot enter. Without coming through the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus Christ, we cannot have forgiveness, nor can we see God. But with forgiveness comes relationship. A relationship that will abound more than we can imagine. Will you accept it today? Instead of trying to reform Will you repent and turn to God for forgiveness? Let's bow together in prayer. Lord, I pray for each of us. We here and those listening across the internet. Lord, I pray for any who have heard your word today and have not yet been forgiven who have not yet received it. Lord, that they would do so today, that they would have no rest until they cry out to you, forgive me, Lord. Lord, we so have often mocked your word, rebelled and been stubborn towards you. We pray for you to break out our stony, stubborn, rebellious hearts full of sin and give us new hearts. Lord, for our nation, we pray that you would awaken us once again. That you would bring many to salvation, even as is your desire. Lord, even as we look to the election, we do pray for good leadership. But Lord, we pray most of all that you would break our nation of its idolatry and sin, of its murder of the innocent. That you would, as a nation, replace our hearts of stone with hearts that exude your word. Lord, for those of us who have been forgiven, who know you as our God, revive our hearts. Give us a fresh glimpse of your face. Empower us with your word. Give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness so that we can be satisfied. Give us a desire for your word. That we would not live by the bread of this world alone, but by every word of God. The examples of what it is to have a new heart, to be under the new covenant, to know our sins are forgiven, and in doing so that we would be ambassadors proclaiming loudly that Jesus Christ has died and buried and rose again on the third day to forgive us of our sins that we would memorialize his death 
every day and moment until he returns. Work, O Lord, in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.